Let's turn today to Romans 15 and verse 30. Paul has just been expressing his longing to come to Rome. We considered that in our last study. And he says he's made plans now to come there after longing to go there for many years. And he says, therefore, uh, since I'm going to Jerusalem, before I come to Rome, I urge you, brethren, verse 30, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. And what does he specifically ask them to pray for? He says, pray that I may be delivered from those who are disobedient, those who are not Christians, in Judea, from the Jewish people, who are always after Paul's blood. Pray that I'll be delivered from them. And that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints. He says, pray that the Christians there will be willing to accept the money I'm bringing to them. That they won't be so proud to say, we're not going to take anything from the Gentiles or anything like that. So Paul believed in prayer. And he believed in praying for little things like protection. When people were trying to harm him. Little things like, Lord, will you make these people accept my ministry? He didn't believe that he was clever enough and smart enough to do all that. And not only his own prayer. He says, pray together with me. I'm also praying that I'll be protected. I'm also praying that my ministry will be accepted by the Christians. But he says, I want you fellows to pray for me too. You there in the church, stand together, have some prayer meetings for me. You know, Paul, one would think that a man like Paul doesn't need anybody to pray for him. Sometimes we think that these great servants of God who stand up in the pulpit and preach so powerfully, they don't need anybody to pray for them. Oh, they've got such gifts, they've got such abilities. Is that true? Well, their abilities are no use if God doesn't anoint them. Even their protection from evil men depends so much on believers praying for them. We need to develop the habit of praying especially for those who are in the forefront of the Lord's battle against Satan. Paul was one of them. Today there are many people like that who are in the forefront of the battle against Satan and Satan's trying to attack them and knock them down in so many ways. Satan's trying to scandalize them and tell false stories about them and do many, many things. Make sure you don't get into that accusation brigade that Satan has but join the prayer brigade, those who pray for God's servants. And he says, pray for me that I may be delivered from those who are disobedient, that my service may be, may be acceptable, so that finally I can come to you in joy by the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company. There again you see his graciousness. He says, I want to find rest when I come into your midst. May the God of peace be with you all. There we see a wonderful example of a true servant of God who is humble enough to acknowledge that he needs prayer help from his fellow believers. Even those young believers in Rome can fulfill a tremendous ministry for Paul by praying for him. And he says further in verse 33, The God of peace be with you you all. Amen. He speaks about God as the God of peace. When God brings unity between Jews and Gentiles, He would have fulfilled His ministry as the God of peace. That's His goal. Moving on to chapter 16, we see here Paul giving a number of greetings to various people whom he has worked with, whom he's heard of, and whom he knows personally. And he expresses his appreciation for them in differing degrees. For example, some people, he says, they worked very hard. Verse 6, greet Mary, who's worked very hard. And he remembers a number of names. Paul was a man who prayed for a number of people individually. And he also prayed for churches. He had a wide list of people he prayed for. 
scattered across different parts of the Mediterranean in different countries. And he recommends certain people to the church in Rome whom he knows well. He says in verse 16, I commend to you our sister Phoebe. That was a dear Christian sister who was probably going to Rome soon. And he says, I want you to know who she is. I mean, they wouldn't know who she is. And he calls her a servant of the church, which is a centuria. And there we see a sister who was a servant of the church. One of the wonderful things we see in Romans 16 is that there are a number of sisters who are active in the Lord's work. Now, a lot of sisters sometimes in India think that they can't do much for the Lord, except be housewives and mothers. But here we see that there were sisters who were very active doing something for the Lord, and particularly in a country like India, where half the population is women, and where it's difficult, very difficult in our society for a man to reach across that barrier to speak to women, who's going to reach half of this country? Women, particularly. Women in the church. A man can preach from the pulpit, but when it comes to personal counseling and so many intimate problems that women have, even in the church, who is going to minister to them? Other godly women. We need women like Phoebe. We need married women like Priscilla, verse 3. We need sisters like Mary, in verse 6. And it's very interesting that in the in this list mentioned in verse 16, the very first ones mentioned are women. Phoebe, first of all, in verse 16. Priscilla and Aquila, verse 3. It's not even Aquila and Priscilla. Notice that. It's Priscilla and Aquila. It's Mrs. and Mr. And Mary, in verse 6. And if that doesn't encourage you as a sister, I don't know what will. That should be an encouragement to you, whether you're a married sister like Prissa or an unmarried sister like Phoebe and Mary. There is a work that you can do for Jesus that no one else but you can do. And if you don't do it, it won't get done. Or some other sister will have to do your job as well and do twice as hard a work. So, every sister must recognize that she has a responsibility in the body of Christ. And so he says concerning Phoebe, she's a servant of the church in Centuria, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints. I believe that's a good exhortation. Receive someone, give her a warm Christian welcome, somebody comes to your church, don't just ignore them, receive them warmly in a manner worthy of the saints. Do you receive strangers into your church in a manner worthy of the saints? And he says that you help her in whatever matter she has a need. You must help her because she herself has been a helper of many people and a helper to me as well. Here was a sister who had ministered to the Apostle Paul, maybe cooked meals for him and washed his clothes or done so many things for him. And not only for Paul but for many others. And he says, people like that, you must also make sure that she is not in any need. So here is a sister who was probably in full-time ministry and uh, traveling and serving and blessing people. And then he says in verse 3, Greet Prissa and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ. You remember, Paul met them in Corinth. They were tent makers and Paul got in touch with them and they got converted. And they became mighty servants of God. This husband-wife team. It's a unique husband-wife team. We don't read of another like that in the New Testament. But every time you read of Priscilla and Aquila, and sometimes Aquila and Priscilla, but they seem to always work together. A wonderful example for husbands and wives. And it appears to me from various passages, I don't have time to show it to you, that this sister probably knew more of the scriptures than her husband. But she, but she never operated on her own. She operated under the headship of her husband. When Apollos was going wrong in his teaching, we read in Acts 18, it was Priscilla and Aquila who called him home and guided him aright. And not only that, it says here in verse 4, these are people 
who risked their necks for Paul's life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles. See, they were willing to take a risk for the sake of Paul. We don't know how, but in some way or the other, they are willing to risk their lives for the sake of Paul. And Paul calls them his fellow workers. Who were his fellow workers? Not only Aquila, but Aquila's wife was a fellow worker of the Apostle Paul. And he says, greet the church that is in their house. In Rome, there were many house churches. The church in Rome comprised not a one group that met in some big hall, you know, that the Christians were persecuted there and they couldn't all meet together. So the church in Rome comprised of a number of house churches and you see a number of them listed here in chapter 16 and one of them was the house church that met in the house of Aquila and Priscilla. God sovereignly arranged for Paul to meet with them having the same trade as them. And that led to their conversion, that led to their being instructed in the scriptures. And finally, they went to Rome and they established a church there. And Paul says, the whole church, churches of the Gentiles, give thanks for them. He says, greet Epinetus, my beloved, who is the first convert to Christ from Asia. That is Asia Minor, that area of Turkey, which is today Turkey. And that area, Paul says, there's this brother Epinetus who has now come to Rome. He's a beloved brother of mine. He was the first convert to Christ from Asia. And he's come there. Paul remembers these people who came to the Lord. You see, Paul's concern not only for churches, but for individuals. A true father who's concerned for individuals and not just for large groups. That is the mark of a true servant of God. And every one of us who serves God must follow Paul's example here.